This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. The podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. My name is Dustin Smith and I will be your host. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We have episode 283 entitled, Exploring the Triad in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6. In our recent episodes, we've been looking through the New Testament at these passages to where a triad appears. A triad is the combination of God, Jesus, and the Spirit appearing either in the same sentence or in the same breath or in a couple of sentences and Trinitarians typically point to these passages and say, look, right there, there is clear, unambiguous evidence that the New Testament authors believed in the Trinity, they taught the Trinity, it wasn't a development, it wasn't something that was codified in the 4th and 5th centuries, it's right there on the pages of the New Testament. So I thought it'd be good for us to look at each of these examples to see what exactly is being said in these triads. Now we've looked in Matthew, We've looked in Romans, we've looked in 1 Corinthians, and we've looked in 2 Corinthians, and we have yet to find any evidence of the doctrine of the Trinity. When we looked at the evidence much more closely, we see that there's actually one God, and Jesus is distinct from the one God, and the one God is never defined as three distinct persons. This week, we'll be looking at the book of Galatians, where there's a passage to where, again, God, Jesus, and the Spirit appear together, and the passage is sometimes argued to indicate that the Apostle Paul was teaching the doctrine of the Trinity. This is the conclusion that you might get if you're reading N.T. Wright's commentary on Galatians. But what does Galatians chapter 4 have to say about God, Jesus, and the Spirit? Is this actually evidence of the doctrine of the Trinity in the pages of the New Testament? Or is there something much more nuanced going on within the passage? Well, let's find out on this week's episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Our first point today is looking at the triad in Paul's letter to the Galatians. Let's read our target passage. Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6. So there you have it in the course of three Verses, we have a reference to God, a reference to the Son, and a reference to the Spirit. In fact, all three of them appear in chapter 4, verse 6. We have God sending the Spirit of his Son. There you have it. God, the Son, and the Spirit. Is that evidence for a triune God in the teachings of Paul? Is Paul abandoning the Jewish monotheistic creed, the Shema, in order to redefine God as three persons? Well, if we take a closer look, we can gain some clarity on this subject. So first, let's look at the person of God within this passage. We're going to focus just on this passage for now, and then later we can expand our search to look at what the book of Galatians has to say on God, Jesus, and the Spirit. So just in this passage in verses 4 through 6 in Galatians chapter 4, we can see that God is more specifically defined as the God with the definite article, Otheos, both in verse 4 and in verse 6. So when Paul is defining God here, it is the one God, the one true God, the God that everyone knows and understands within the Christian community. We can also see evidence that this God is one single person. What sort of evidence, you might ask? Well, we can see that the Son is called His Son. His, of course, is a singular pronoun, proving 
that God, who has his Son, that one God is a single person, a singular him. And since the Son is the Son of God, that means that God is the Father alone. We can also see that this God is governed by singular verbs. So the verb to send in verse 4 is singular. The verb to redeem in verse 5 is singular. And we have the verb to send again appearing in verse 6, also being singular. So the God is defined by singular pronouns and by singular verbs. I'm not quite seeing a triune God yet. We can also see that the Spirit empowers the redeemed to address God as Abba, Father, the same sort of designation that Jesus made in Gethsemane, according to the Gospel of Mark. And by the Spirit empowering the believers to define God as Abba, Father, we are again seeing that God is the Father alone. Note carefully that the Spirit is not empowering believers to define God as Father, Son, and Spirit. No, this one God, who is defined by singular pronouns and singular verbs, is cried out to by believers who possess the Spirit, and this God is addressed as Abba, Father, thereby getting the name Father in two different languages. We have it in Aramaic, and we have it in Greek. So God is a single person. What about the Son? What about Jesus? Well, we can see that the Son, of course, is the Son of God. And this means that Jesus is distinct from and distinguished from the God, rather than Jesus being collapsed into the being of God. It's not God the Father and God the Son. It's God the Father alone and that God has a son, someone who is distinguished from him. The son is distinguished from the one God. We can also see that Jesus was born. In fact, in Greek, he is begotten. He is begotten of a woman, begotten under the law. And the phrase born of a woman uses the preposition ek, where we get the word exit. He was born by coming out of a woman, not via the preposition, which means through, as if the son came in through Mary and then came out after his birth. No, he was born out of a woman. And being born of a woman is the typical phrase in the Bible to refer to someone being born. Like John the Baptist was born of a woman. Now, we can see that the phrase born of a woman is set in parallel to the phrase, born under the law. Why would Paul point out that Jesus was born under the law? Well, this is to indicate that Jesus was Jewish. To be born under the law means that you are a child of Israel. Now, Paul places the birth of the son at his conception, involving his mother. When was Jesus born? When was the son born? Well, he was born of a woman. That woman, of course, is a Jewish woman because Jesus was born under the law. So Paul places the birth of Jesus at the time of his conception. This would indicate that Paul is not saying that Jesus was born any time prior to this. He is the Son. He is the Son of God. But he becomes the Son at his birth, specifically when he exits the womb of of his Jewish mother. Now, Paul does, in fact, say that God sent his son. And some interpreters will try to squeeze blood from a stone, and they'll look at this and they'll say, well, look, that's clearly a reference to literal preexistence. God sent forth his son from heaven. And they will look at the ordering of verse 4, and they will say, well, look, God sent forth the Son, and then he was born, indicating that the Son was in existence prior to the birth. God sent the Son, he came into the womb of Mary, and then he was born. However, this verb to send in Greek, ex apostello, 
is used all over the New Testament to refer to sendings that are casual in nature, like Jacob sending the ancestors to Egypt in Acts 7 verse 12, or a landowner casually sending slaves to check on his produce in Luke chapter 20 verses 10 to 11. Or it could be a sending that is a commissioning, like the sending and commissioning of a prophet to give him a particular ministry. So Jesus sends Paul, using the very same verb here, ex apostello, Jesus sends Paul to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 22, verse 21, using the same verb. So we don't get the indication that God sending forth a son has to refer to some sort of preexistence in heaven. There's no indication of that at all anywhere in this passage or anywhere in Galatians. You get the impression that the son was born of a woman, that he was sent as someone who is very important, as someone who was sent on a mission, a ministry from God. And since the mission of Jesus is defined by Paul in chapter 4, verse 5, as one who redeems those under the law, it would seem that Paul is speaking of God sending forth Jesus as a commissioned agent. In doing so, the phrases born of a woman and born under the law are unpacking the time when this commissioning took place. In other words, Jesus was on a mission as a Jew to redeem Jews right from his birth. So God sent forth his son. Let's unpack what that means. So the sending forth occurred when Jesus was born of a woman and born under the law. Jesus was on his ministry as a Jew to redeem those under the law right from the moment of his birth. More on that later. Now, we've talked about God. We've talked about the Son. What about the Spirit in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6? We can also see that the Spirit was sent by God. God sent the Son in verse 4, and God sent the Spirit in verse 6. What does the Spirit do? Well, the Spirit empowers the redeemed to speak forth their new identity within this redeemed family of God. The redeemed are now the children of God, since God is their father. Notice, God is a father. They are the children. Their relationship to God further clarifies God's identity as the father alone. They're not children of Jesus. They're not children of the Spirit. They're children of God. They are God's children. And the Spirit empowers the believers to identify the true God as Abba Father. Now, just as Jesus is the Son of God, the believers share in the sonship or the adoption of this particular family of God because God, of course, is the Father. The Spirit here is called the Spirit of His Son, which closely associates the Spirit with the risen and exalted Jesus. Now, the only clue that Paul gives in regard to this sonship status with the phrase Spirit of His Son involves the fact that redeemed believers also are regarded as sons and daughters of God, namely as God the Father. Now notice, this is not the definition of the Spirit that we see in the 4th and 5th century church councils, to where the Spirit is a conscious person, the third person within the identity of the triune God. For Paul, this is the Spirit of his Son. And again, that singular pronoun, his, indicates that God is one person. Who is that one person? Well, the Spirit tells us. The Spirit indicates that this one God is the Father alone. Again, it's the Spirit of His Son. So the Spirit is empowering believers to make a Unitarian confession of God, not a Trinitarian confession. So while the doctrine of the Trinity teaches that the one God is three persons, the Father, Son, and Spirit, Paul gives a different 
definition for God. For Paul, God is a single person, the Father alone. Jesus is the Son of God, who is born, he is brought into existence, the Spirit empowers and enables believers to identify the true God in Unitarian terminology, and the Spirit identifies the believers as the adopted children of the one God, the Father alone. So now that we've looked at this passage, what other clues about God, Jesus, and the Spirit might we gather from exploring Galatians as a whole? And by exploring the entirety of Galatians and what it has to say about God, the Son, and the Spirit, how might we be able to set our target passage, chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, in its literary context? This moves us to our second point. Point number two, what Galatians teaches about God. Let's start in the opening chapter. In chapter 1, starting in verse 4, it talks about Jesus who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. That's Galatians 1, verses 4 through 5. So we have Jesus who gives himself, but he's doing this according to the will of God. And who is this God? This God is our God. Our God is defined as the Father. Our God is defined with singular references. To whom? A singular reference. Our God is a single person. Our God is distinguished from Jesus who gave himself. A little bit later in chapter 1, Paul says that when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. That's Galatians 1, 15 through 16. We have some interesting pieces of data in this passage. First, we can see that even Paul understood his own apostolic commissioning in terms of being called, set apart from his mother's womb. So it's no surprise that in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, God can commission Jesus from his mother's womb because Paul also believed this was possible. In fact, he writes here in his own autobiography that God had called him from his mother's womb. We can also see that this God was pleased to reveal his son in Paul. Again, we could see that singular pronoun. God revealed his son indicating that God is a singular person. And of course, if God reveals his son, that would mean that God has to be the father because the singular pronoun is masculine. God is the father alone. His son is distinguished from God. Now, we can see that Paul reaffirms the Jewish Shema in Galatians 3.20. Paul says, Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. That's Galatians 3.20. Now, what's going on here is that Paul is contrasting the way that God communicated in the Old Covenant to where God would actually commission various angels to communicate his words and his commandments on the way down to the children of Israel. But something better is going on right now in the New Covenant to where God is not functioning through these mediators to convey his will. So the contrast is that a mediator is not for one party only. Okay, The mediator obviously has a one party on one side, that would be God, and the mediating angel would function in between the other party, the children of Israel, to where in the second half of the verse, Paul is contrasting the concept of having a mediator function with God being only one. That is, to be only one person. God is only one person. This here is Paul reaffirming the Jewish Shema from Deuteronomy 6.4. Paul's not splitting the Shema to add the Son in it. That's absolutely ridiculous. Paul's reaffirming the oneness and unity of God in his letter to the Galatians. And that's clear because God is the Father alone. 
God is defined with singular pronouns and singular verbs. So God, of course, is one person. Paul is being a good Jewish Christian, not a Trinitarian. Let's move to our third point, what Galatians teaches about the Son. So in Galatians 2.20, it says that the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's Galatians 2.20. So Paul is living according to the faithfulness of the Son of God. And how did the Son of God demonstrate his faithfulness, his faithfulness to God? Well, Jesus loved Paul and Jesus gave himself up for Paul. This is the Son of God giving his entire self, giving his entire self over to die on behalf of Paul. This is the whole self. This is not Jesus supposedly having two natures, a divine nature that is immortal, but a human nature that can die and only one of those natures dies. No, when Paul describes the death of Jesus, it is Jesus giving himself up for Paul. We already saw that in chapter 1, verse 4. Jesus gave himself for our sins. Paul's never thinking or considering that Jesus' two natures and only one of them dies on behalf of God's people. Jesus gives all of himself up because he completely died because he's a human being. He's a descendant of Abraham. He's a descendant of David. He is born of a woman. In chapter 3, verse 16, we get a little bit more evidence of this. Paul says that now the promises are spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. That's Galatians 3.16. So Paul here is playing a little bit of ambiguity with the word seed, which can refer to something that is plural or could refer to something that is singular. But what he's doing here is he's indicating that the promises made to Abraham were not made to multiple families, but to one particular family, that is the Christ family. But in doing so, he describes Jesus as the seed of Abraham. This means that Abraham is the ancestor of Jesus, and Jesus was someone who came through the biological line of Abraham. This means that Jesus, of course, is an Israelite. And it means that Jesus didn't pre-exist Abraham, at least not consciously, because Jesus is the seed of Abraham. So Jesus is a human being. And Paul is defining this by quoting the Old Testament, by quoting Genesis. Now, in chapter 4, verse 14, we have another passage which is open to some interpretation. Paul says, That which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. That's Galatians 4, 14. Now, some people have read this passage and said, well, look what Paul's doing. He's saying, you receive me as an angel, namely as Christ Jesus. That means that Jesus is an angel. Now, that, of course, would not prove the doctrine of the Trinity. It would just mean that Jesus is some sort of heavenly angel, which would contradict what Paul had already said in chapter 316. It would contradict the fact that Jesus was born of a woman, because angels typically are not born that way. But we also need to know is that the Greek noun angelos, translated as angel, could simply refer to a messenger. And I actually think that messenger is the intended meaning of what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that when he came to visit them, he had suffered physically. He probably had a black eye. It was difficult for him to see. And he says that the Galatians, to their credit, they accepted him. They didn't despise him. They received him. And I think that they received him as if he was a messenger from God, as if he was Christ Jesus himself. So I think that we need to look at what is the more likely meaning behind what Paul is saying here in a way that is charitable to what Paul has already said about Jesus in other places. If you're going to argue that Jesus is an angel here, at least that disproves the Trinity. But I think that it's much more likely 
that Paul is using angelos here to refer to a human messenger. And Paul has done this in other places as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul uses angelos to refer to human messengers. So that's a possible meaning based on the way that Paul uses that particular word. So that's enough about God, enough about the Son. What about the Spirit? Let's look, this is our fourth point, what Galatians teaches about the Spirit. Let's look at the greetings in the letter to the Galatians. In chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. I don't see the Spirit there. What has happened? Well, the Spirit is not giving greetings. The Spirit never gives greetings in Paul's letters or in any epistolary piece of literature in the New Testament. If Paul believed in the doctrine of Trinity, you would think that it would be God giving a greeting, Jesus giving a greeting, and the Spirit giving a greeting. But that doesn't happen because Paul believes that the Spirit of God is God's extended power and presence that works in the lives of God's people. So, of course, the Spirit's not going to send any greetings. God the Father sends greetings, and Jesus Christ sends greetings, but not the Spirit. Now, the Spirit does begin to appear in chapter 3. It doesn't appear in chapter 1 or chapter 2, but it does appear in chapter 3, 4, 5, and 6. So, in chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says, So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of law or by hearing with faith. That's Galatians 3, verse 5. And we can see that the Spirit is something that is provided to believers, and it was received because they were hearing with faith, not by observing the Jewish works of the law. But what we can see here is that someone is providing the Spirit. Who is providing the Spirit? Well, he is providing the Spirit, and he is working miracles among you. Who is that he? Well, that seems to be God. One person, he, that singular pronoun. The one who provides you with the Spirit is actually a more accurate translation of the Greek in that passage. So we can see the Spirit is given by one person, by God. And of course, this is exactly what we saw in chapter 4, verse 6, where God sent the Spirit. Now, in chapter 5, verse 18, Paul is going to portray the Spirit that is going to recall the way in which this pillar of fire functioned during the Exodus narrative. So, in Galatians 5, 18, Paul says, If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And the image here is the Spirit out in front leading the new covenant people of God on their way to the kingdom of God. And of course, Paul's going to talk about the kingdom of God in the next three verses. But the image of the people of God, the covenant people of God being led by the Spirit, is deliberately echoing back to the children of Israel, not being led by the Spirit, but they are being led by this pillar of of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night, and they are on their way to the promised land. The promised land of the new covenant is, of course, the kingdom of God. But the new covenant believers, those that have been redeemed into this family of God in which they can identify themselves as sons and daughters and they regard God as Abba Father, they are being led by the Spirit. And so the Spirit here is functioning as kind of a new cloud slash pillar of fire, not as a conscious third person that is talking to believers. So in conclusion, what have we learned about God, Jesus, and the Spirit in the book of Galatians? Well, we've seen that God is one person, the Father alone. We see that Paul reaffirms the Shema, and he doesn't split it to include either the Son or the Spirit. We also observe that Jesus is the Son of God, who is born of a woman. He's the seed of Abraham, which makes him younger than Abraham. Jesus died by offering his entire self, not part of him or supposed human nature instead of his divine nature. No, Jesus offered himself, all of himself, 100% of him. The Spirit, we saw, marks out the new covenant people of God. The Spirit doesn't send any greetings. The Spirit functions as the extended power of God that 
leads believers into the kingdom of God. And in doing so, it recalls the Exodus narrative when the pillar of fire led the people of God on the way to their promised land. So in sum, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6 is not, upon close inspection, a reference to the triune God. In fact, it's actually a Unitarian text, proving that God is one person, the Father alone. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Join us next week as we look at another triad in the New Testament, this next one in Ephesians chapter 3, and we will examine it in the same way that we've done our previous triads. Please look forward to our next episode. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider supporting us as we promote the sound and non-negotiable truths of the oneness and unity of God and the humanity of Jesus. You can support us absolutely for free by subscribing, by giving us an honest review online, and by sharing your favorite episodes with your friends. If you'd like to offer a donation, please check out the episode's description for a PayPal link. The Biblical Unitarian Podcast is produced and edited by Dustin Williams. I am Dustin Smith, your host. Until next time, please take care.